Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Covey here at Brock University, and it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, our next speaker in our 2017 uh, Covey Lecture Series. Today, we're proud to introduce Covey's senior staff uh, viticulturist, Dr. Jim Wilworth, who will be discussing the potential impacts of climate change on grapevine dormancy and cold hardiness. Uh, Jim's been with us here at Covey since 2010, uh, where he's been performing research and outreach on priorities as set by the Ontario and broader uh, Canadian grape and wine industry. The major focus of his research to date uh, pertains to cold hardiness and crop protection of our uh, vines that are uh, planted here uh, in Canada. Uh, some of his current research projects include uh, freeze protection strategies, you'll hear uh, about some of that today, improving cold um, tolerance during dormancy, uh, clone rootstock uh, evaluations, leaf removal practices for sparkling and still wines, and uh, also delving into creating uh, new bird deterrent strategies uh, because, of course, we, we always have pressures uh, from the birds uh, on our crops here. Jim is also one of the primary investigators of the Vine Alert Cold Hardiness Program, and today he'll be drawing on a lot of the, the data that goes into that Vine Alert system uh, during his talk today. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Jim. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, it's always great to, uh, to, to be speaking. I'm just going to a couple lecture series. And it's nice to be uh, you know, at a university where I can talk about something like climate change and use that word, or those yeah. words. Um, no kidding, though. I mean, there's a lot of issues uh, worldwide <laughs> with discussing this. It's like saying uh, Voldemort or something like that if you're a Harry <laughs> Potter fan. So today I want to talk about climate change, what we've seen in the last since 2010, really, since I've been here at the university, over the, we've had many different weather scenarios uh, over the dormant period. And I want to draw on what we have found over the years and how that can relate to future predictions with climate change. I'm not a climatologist by any means. I'm on the other side and looking how plants respond to climate. And so I hope this is a nice segue from uh, Dr. Tony Shaw's talk from last week, where he gave an overview of what are some of the expectations with climate change, how it can impact us here in our growing regions. But I want to try to connect some dots with, in terms of cold hardiness and, and how, it's, how this can impact our grapes. So freeze injury is one of the greatest threats to, to agriculture. And one single event can, can lead to crop loss, and that can occur any time during the warmer period or even post-bud break. And that's one of the issues that I'm going to talk about, is that the, the threat of, of freeze injury can actually increase with, with climate change. And it's going to impact, climate change is going to impact all areas of agriculture. And when I say all areas, I'm not just talking about cash, far, or cash crop farming or tender fruit. It's going to impact livestock, aquaculture, all different areas of agriculture in general. And part of the issue is that it's, it, we have an unpredictable future, and it's going to, there's going to be a lot of increased challenges with that. And right now, if we would stop all carbon dioxide emissions and so on, we still don't know how, it's going, how the climate's going to be impacted 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. So this is like a, a really serious situation where we don't know what's going to happen. But through hopefully understanding short-term weather events, we, we can hopefully lead to, help lead to some innovation, innovative solutions for the future. And that's where I want to try to connect some dots here and lead to future uh, innovative strategies. This is uh, a chart that I got from the US uh, EPA, hopefully not the former EPA. And it just, it's looking at uh, corn production, but you can see the variability in yields over the years and how various extreme events, whether they're wet springs and, and so on that can impact uh, uh, germination and, and, and production to droughts that lead to significant uh, decreases as well as what they call unusual climate events. So I just want to show you that over a 50 year period, we're finding that yes, production is going up as if you look at those moving trends, but look at in between. Those are what you have to worry about, all those vari the variability in those extreme years. So in terms of specific issues in climate change and viticulture, what are some of the issues specific to, to grapes? One is that they're not, a, it's not a, uh, an annual like corn. Uh, they are perennial woody plants, which make them more complex in terms of overwintering, in terms of how one year can impact the next year, and so on and so forth. 
When it comes to our premium grapes, uh, grape vines, they're susceptible to pests and disease, lots of them. Uh, and one of the big things is that they're sensitive to frost and freeze injury. Very, very sensitive to, to that. Furthermore, just looking at in terms of fruit quality, uh, when it comes to wine, we're, varieties have this thing called typicity, and the environment in, it, in the terroir impacts that typicity in that regional style. And regions that grow grapes have a distinct style, and changing climate can impact that. In many areas, it's all it's in the ground of grapes. I mean, we're seeing that more and more just in Niagara. We're seeing more grapes in the ground, less other tender fruits. And when you put all your eggs in one basket and something happens, it can be more serious. And overall, like I said, environmental changes are gonna impact grapevines. And this is gonna impact not only the vines itself, but into the winemaking production and style, quality, and everything that goes into that. So in terms of if you look at just an overview of climate change, we're looking at higher carbon, carbon dioxide levels, and this will impact production if you look at it as a single entity, a single factor. However, usually what will happen with higher CO2 levels is you'll also have higher temperatures, more drought, and so on and so, on and so forth. So it's not a simple relation, linear relationship. One of the big problems when it comes to, to dormancy and hardiness is these types of things, like extreme temperature and precipitation. And when it comes to the variability in our climate and these extremes, this is one area of, of grave concern in terms of agriculture. Again, if you look at linear trends, you say, oh, it's warming, it's warming, it's getting better. Well, it's those extremes that are gonna be the big problem, like I showed in that very first graph with the corn. And these extremes can include both floods or droughts, but also wildfires and habitat loss. And you look at wildfire, not only you have direct loss to a wildfire, but what are some of the indirect consequences of a wildfire in grape production? Smoke taint. So you have a forest fire in a region near grapes, the next thing you know, the whole crop is tainted. The other problem is pests. Um, pests can, can increase. I mean, we're in, we're in a northern climate uh, in, in North America here, but things can move up from, from down in the States and into Canada, whether they're insects or diseases, uh, like Pierce's disease, which is fairly limited, you know, that can move its way throughout uh, areas of, of the U.S. And think of just Lyme disease here in, in Ontario. It's, it wasn't really a big issue, but it's going to be more of an issue as we're getting warmer winters and climate. And so pests are moving to non-traditional areas and even diseases that we once had and we've always had with their vectors, such as viruses, those, we can end up getting more, vec more vectors that carry disease similar to the deer tick and Lyme disease for humans. So it's, it's very complex. But what are some of the trends and scenarios that, that have been shown from some studies worldwide in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, viticulture? One is that every viticulture region is going to be impacted by climate change. Some are going to be more severely impacted than others. Yes, it can, it can increase some, um, some possible new regions, uh, and, may, and maybe some countries, like the Scandinavian countries, may be more successful. However, areas that are already hot and dry, it's only going to get worse, likely, in those areas. Or we could end up having other extreme events, which I'll talk about. As Dr. Shaw talked about last week, shift, we're having a shift in warmer growing seasons. And we're also finding is that earlier bud break uh, bloom in veraison, and then also shorter periods from flowering to harvest. However, getting back to these two main points that I want to make is we're going to have more extremes in temperature and precipitation, as well as a lot more variability in erratic weather. And that's where, when I talk about dormancy, that's what I want to, I want to bring about. But it isn't just warming. And uh, there's a quote from a professor of atmospheric chemistry at University of Leeds. And they published a paper in, uh, he was one of the co-authors in a paper in, that was published in Nature about the polar vortex. And his quote here is, climate change can lead to extremes. It's not like a regular change. Everyone to the same extent at all times and places. Despite the overall warming, you can get in places like the northeastern US extreme cold events. That's consistent with climate change and global warming. So that's something for us to think about. It's not just warming. And here's an example of the one of our most devastating winters that we've, we've had in recent memory, and that's 2015. And you see warming in, in over January and February, and then you see this big cold spot in eastern North America. That's the polar vortex. So these are possible scenarios that we could see in the future. And it's this cold Arctic air 
the surge of air moving into the south, and, it's, and you can see the impact of the jet stream. And when these areas are really cold, you can see the west coast gets is warmer. And so a lot of times what's impacting things in BC will be the complete opposite here. So when we're warm here, sometimes they're cold and vice versa. And this kind of looks like a picture out of uh, the day after tomorrow. If you know that movie from, I think it was 2004 or something like that. And it talked about the warming of the oceans and the change of the currents and how it created this superstorm. Well, that's kind of, in a nutshell, again, I'm not a climatologist, but how the polar vortex, it it's kind of mimics the uh, aspects of that. And you can see here, if you know the area, this is, uh, this is uh, Point Abano, Lake Erie. So this is kind of where I grew up, and this is uh, right on the other side of this point. And you can see Lake Erie was completely frozen. And from the aerial footage, you can see Erie was frozen, and Ontario had a lot of ice. And this really impacts the, uh, the overwintering of vines because we lose that lake effect. The most important, one of the most important characteristics of the Niagara Peninsula, as well as Lake Erie North Shore and other regions, we depend on the Great Lakes. And so that is a huge consequence if we have these types of systems. And this is just an example of when you have an event like that, how much damage can occur and how quickly. So over the period of two days, over 90% of the potential crop was lost in Lake Erie North Shore, for example, and it didn't get much better later in the year. And we had that for a couple of years in a row. So that's a huge consequence of, of things like the polar vortex. I talked a little bit about trends, and this is some, some work for, published from, uh, from Dr. Greg Jones et al. Uh, and what I just want to show here is how this is impacting major grape growing regions in terms of climate change, in terms of shift in the growing season and, and shift in phenology. Areas like Alsace and Burgundy, we're seeing trends of uh, bud break occurring earlier and earlier. With that, also bloom is earlier by two weeks, raisin by almost three weeks, and same with harvest. Now, for those of you who, understand, who have been to Alsace and know, understand their wines, or have been to some talks, even here, uh, with Olivier Hungrist, he talked a lot about climate change and what they're seeing in Alsace. And if you drink Alsatian wines, you could tell that there's a, there's a different style now in their wines. They're, they're dealing with, they have cool climate varieties like us, and they're having issues with controlling, they want ripening to slow down. And, and they're having air, uh, issues of higher alcohol. They're, they're always known to have dry wines. Now their wines are more off dry, having issues with fermentations because they have, their sugar levels are so high. And this is a common trend uh, in many areas where we're, we're having earlier harvests and this earlier bud break. So what are some of the consequences of that? And this is just this past year in Europe. So according to Decanter, Burgundy hit by worse frost since 1981. This other picture here is in the Loire Valley, and they were trying to use some overhead sprinklers to, to mitigate the cold, because you can see here that the buds had already broken. This is not just a Canadian thing. This is a worldwide <coughs> thing. And when we have a push of an earlier bud break, these are some of the consequences. So after that little overview, I want to just have a couple slides on cold, cold hardiness and acclimation. So you have an understanding of how climate can impact hardiness. So when it comes to hardiness, the simplest definition is the ability of plant tissue to survive freezing plant stresses. And it's a complex trait. And different varieties and different species have, a, have, a, have, their, uh, have an inherent genetic potential. And this is all driven by environmental conditions. And it's a highly dynamic condition. So a perfect example is, this is always a nice slide to show, or a nice uh, image to show, is in a colder area, vines can be more cold tolerant, that same given vine, than in a warm area. And that's just because of the, the climatic conditions. So Chardonnay in California, for example, think of this as a, a typical uh, uh, graph for, uh, for grape or Chardonnay, let's say in California, and this is, would be more to Ontario standards, where under cold conditions, we can drive those vines to their maximum potential. And there's a period of acclimation, maximum hardiness, which is generally the midwinter period, and this period of deacclimation. In terms of winter dormancy, how do we define it? Well, basically, the suspension of, of uh, visible growth. 
And it's induced by the environment, but as well as endogenous signals. So these are low temperatures, photo periods, so day length and so on. Uh, and it's under a lot of hormonal control. Now there's two stages of dormancy during winter. One is endodormancy. And this is what is the first stage of dormancy and it's the inhibition of growth and it's regulated by physiological factors. This cannot be broken by warmer temperatures when the vine are in this stage. That's really important to know. The second is eco dormancy and that's what it's, a, it's the second stage of dormancy where it's a result of unsuitable environment. So things like stresses, cold temperatures, deficiencies, that will uh, keep the vine uh, dormant and, and from breaking. And interestingly enough, the vines reach maximum hardiness and plants in general reach their maximum hardiness during this eco-dormant period. And that's because they've reached their chilling requirements. So chilling requirements are, are um, they require a number of chilling hours at a low temperature to break that endodormancy. And it does differ by variety. And most vinifera need about 150 chilling hours, but certain varieties need more or need less. And those are the number of hours roughly below 7C or so, but this does vary by variety as well. And there's more work being done in this field. So in, until they reach these chilling requirements, they, the, a plant, a woody plant cannot break this period of endodormancy. Now that's generally not a problem here in Canada, and we usually reach our chilling requirements by probably in December. But in some regions, it can be really important. And you look at some of the warmer areas of California, uh, in the Middle East, places like that, there, there can be issues in terms of uh, vines reaching their amount of chilling requirements. Similar to the other crops, grapes are only 150 chilling, 150 chilling hours. Uh, peaches and so on have, are a lot higher, they'd be up to 800 hours. So it can make a big difference between different uh, crops that we're growing. So this is something to consider in terms of dormancy issues when you don't have proper number of chilling requirements. So I'm not going to discuss acclimation too much other than it's basically uh, a simplest definition is going from a cold tender to a cold hardy state. There's a lot of complex things happening um, from everything from gene expression and chemical changes uh, to physical changes like periderm formation that you can actually see on the plant. Uh, and again, there's lots of hormone involved and, and there's some now cold, cold hardiness genes that have been identified. So in terms of looking at vinifera specifically, there's two stages. The first one is induced by cool but above freezing temperatures and shorter days. And then the second one, and this is what starts to really drive the, the, the acclimation in the vines, is when we have these temperatures that are below freezing that, that continue to induce acclimation. And again, like I mentioned, the maximum hardiness is usually during the coldest period of time, and that can vary from year to year, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides. But this usually occurs after those vines are, are through endodormancy and during that eco-dormant period. Again, it's a cumulative process, and this can be stopped, reversed, restarted, all on temperature fluctuations. So think about that when I talked about temperature variability and how this can impact acclimation and then also deacclimation here, which this is the opposite of acclimation where it's going from a cold hardy to a cold standard, tender state. And this is driven highly by temperature. It's more rapid than acclimation. So acclimation can take weeks to months for a plant to fully acclimate, whereas deacclimation can happen within days or weeks. And especially if those temperatures are very mild and we have very warm nights and so on. Acclimation, it's slower because it depends on a, lot of more, a large amount of energy and there's lots of changes in structure and function, whereas deacclimation is fueled by metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins that were synthesized during acclimation. And they're moving quickly to, uh, they've, they've used up a lot of the, the plants have used up a lot of their resources and they're looking at uh, starting to grow again for the next year. And this is probably one of the most important areas in terms of research to be done in terms of cold hardiness and how climate change can impact uh, this area of hardiness. Because like I said, by in, for Ontario, for example, by January, the only thing that's keeping those vines dormant is cold temperatures. And this is another area of interest is reacclimation. So this is basically when plants are gaining back hardiness. 
So as you can see in this simplified uh, chart here, that they're never static. There's changes throughout uh, dormancy. And after a warming period, we can end up having a little bit of a reduction in hardiness. And then following some colder temperatures, it, the vines can gain a little bit back. And you see it in a couple instances here in this, in this chart. However, it's not well known, it's poorly understood, and different varieties seem, seem to be able to reacclimate better than others. Um, and I'll show you a couple of examples uh, when I'm talking about how some of these different varieties perform. But it seems that the vinifera varieties aren't as suited to reacclimate. They will, but not to the same extent as some other varieties or some other species. So look at this. It looks almost like some of the temperature graphs that we see, but this is actually hardiness variation from year to year. And you know, if you have a somewhat uh, short-term memory, you can see in the last seven years, seven winters, hey, those vines don't look, they haven't performed the same, they haven't acted the same in each one of those winters. We have different periods of acclimation, big differences in terms of maximum hardiness, and holy cow, look how the vines have come out of dormancy every year is much different. And I'll show some more slides later, but you could just see the variation from year to year at a given time. Uh, you know, you have well, three degrees of maximum hardiness. And in this period of time, you can have up to 15 degrees difference in hardiness at a given date. So this is where the Von Eller program has really been a solution to help mitigate the changes of, in our climate because we've had areas or seasons with those polar vortex to very warm years, like this year, which it was the warmest February in the last 50 years, okay? And turn that around, and I think it was three years ago, we had the coldest February in record. That's huge, and that's all during dormancy. Does it matter if you have, if, if you have a great growing season if everything's wiped out during winter? No. When it comes to grapevines, they're not all equal. They're diverse. There's many different species that, you know, in that, and these species are part of the interspecific hybrids that are important in the eastern uh, U.S. And, and parts of Canada. But, I mean, in terms of vinifera, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of varieties out there. And these all differ with respect to their growing season requirements in terms of how they tolerate drought, wet conditions. And then, like I said, they differ in terms of the hardiness, in terms of how their chilling requirements are, how they acclimate or deacclimate in terms of their maximum potential. If you, and a perfect example is looking at, you know, Syrah versus Riesling here in Ontario. You could, there's a huge difference in terms of the two varieties. Fruit maturation, we know that. You know, a, an early ripening variety like uh, Oxawa, to compare that to Cabernet Sauvignon. And again, these, we're growing these different varieties within Ontario, so even with, in, in Canada. So we have a huge amount of variation just within our own country, let alone worldwide. And all of these changes are going to impact how they perform. And what happens in the growing season can impact what happens in dormancy and vice versa. So just in terms of cultivar differences, this is just cultivar differences at one location um, in, uh, in, in one given year. And you know, here's a perfect example. The Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc are your more tender ones, and varieties like Chardonnay and the Red and Cabernet Franc are some of the more hardy ones. But, they, they will change over the dormant period. And some of these varieties that are very hardy in midwinter or acclimate a bit better, they might not be as same hardy at a given time later in the year. And I'm gonna give you a really good example of this. Cold hardy hybrids, they're the savior of, 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 uh, of cold climate regions, right? They're, 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 they're uh, hybrids that have been selected as for extreme cold hardiness. They have a lot of riparian in their background and they, in a very cold winter, this is 2015, six, or 2014-15, um, and sorry, this is LT50 on this, on this uh, axis, and this is date over here. You see two Minnesota hybrid varieties, Marquette and Frontenac. And you look at the maximum hardiness in January, middle of January, and you're up below negative 30 for these two cultivars. And one of our most hardy vinifera, <coughs> Riesling, is well, 10 degrees less cool tolerant at that given time. That's, that's substantial, right? In terms, especially when we had temperatures of negative 28 or so at this given time in that year. However, once temperatures start to warm up, hey, wait a second, these are less cool tolerant than, than Riesling. 
They have a different, they have different requirements in terms of breaking dormancy and, and deacclimating. They are, since, because they have that, some of our native species in an early ripening variety or species like riparia, what we find is that it, it, at uh, lower temperatures, they deacclimate more. Does that make sense? Whereas vinifera varieties, they, they, they'll move out of dormancy a little bit slower. They require slightly higher temperatures. And it's probably f f due to their origins. Um, whereas we're in a, uh, riparia is based in a cold climate area, whereas vinifera are in a warmer, in an area of warmer winters. So if they evolved in an area where we had warmer winters, they would break, break butt too, break butt too soon, yes. Okay, so look at this slide. Look what happens during a warm year, like last year. Wait a second, these varieties did not reach their maximum potential, whereas they did in the cold weather. So they were about 10 degrees less cold tolerant in a year where we had a warm winter. I should have had some temperature data here too, just to, just to show you that. And with that, they didn't acclimate as, as deeply, they didn't get as, as much uh, deep cold hardiness, but they also, again, more cold sensitive than even Chardonnay later in the season in March. However, you see that with the vinifera, there's less uh, uh, deacclimation and reacclimation, whereas a variety like Marquette, you're seeing a lot of ups and downs over the season, which is really interesting. So this is, this is an area of research that I think is really, really interesting. And, and this is really showing how genetics impacts hardiness and that between genetics and the environment. And then this is a, a really cool graph that, that uh, Mary Jasinski uh, did up for me where it shows the three different years. It might be a little bit busy, but you could just see when everything's standardized in the same graph, how, how deep uh, into acclimation these, some of these uh, hybrids will go in a cold climate. So they perform very, very well when it's cold and stays cold. But then in warmer years, there's a lot of ups and downs in terms of their uh, cold hardiness. And it's some, sometimes they're not as hardy even as Chardonnay. And right now, Marquette is about as hardy as Chardonnay at this given time. And Chardonnay, for those who don't know, it's a earlier butter it, uh, in terms of uh, vinifera species or, or vinifera varieties. And it, um, it uh, deacclimates uh, sooner than varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Riesling, and so on. So that just shows the difference of a winter and how different varieties perform. So think about how climate change is going to impact these different varieties. So again, back to this graph. How, how do we predict uh, hardiness? And, and it's difficult to predict when our, when our winters, we can't predict how our winters are going to be. How are we going to predict how the vine response is? So many times we had, oh, this is going to be a winter from hell from Environment Canada or, or elsewhere, and it's, and it's not that way. In other years, well, it's going to be mild winter. It ends up being deadly. So, well, I shouldn't say deadly because it could be deadly when it's warm, but you could have a very severe cold winter with lots of snow. So it's, it's, very, uh, it's very difficult and only through continuing this type of work that we're in getting a lot of information, a lot of different seasons under our belt where we're collecting this type of information that we could potentially uh, get into some accurate uh, models. But if you look at the climate change models, they're all over the map too. So it's, this is really hard to, 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 to deal with and work with. Now, as I explained, uh, warming during eco dormancy is probably the greatest risk of freezing. It's probably the greatest risk of climate change. Yeah, we have, can have real extreme temperatures, but this erratic conditions are probably the most dangerous in terms of, of uh, freeze injury, especially when we have periods of, of um, let me see if I can, periods of warming such as this, and this isn't even that extreme of example, but when we have periods of warming followed by boom, a big dip in temperature. I mean, even last night, we had a 20 degree dip in temperature overnight. That's not good. I mean, especially this time of year where we're having, uh, where deacclimation is starting to occur, we can have susceptible, not only buds, but trunks, canes, and so on. So it's, it's these, these ups and downs are not, are not good. And this is a, an example of some uh, events that we've had over the last few years of how, in showing how warm weather can impact the vines. So these are some of our warmer winters. And you can see for this, I'll use this year as an example and I'll compare it to 2011-12. 
2011-12 was this year where we lost 15 degrees of hardiness in a matter of two weeks. Huge rates of uh, deacclimation. It was a mild year, and this year, like I said, this is a result of one of the warmest Februarys on record. As you can see, the vines are, you know, for Chardonnay, and this is just one site, are about three degrees less cold tolerant at that given stage. And we're fortunate that we've had a, a fairly cold March because you, look how, how much they've deacclimated, and that's with the colder weather. As soon as we get any warm weather, they're going to really move. And now we're going to be susceptible to spring frost or late winter frost, which once water starts moving through the tissue, the, the results are going to be a lot more devastating. Instead of losing buds, you can lose entire vines. And then the recovery is even worse in terms of the, 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 um, the effects. In a colder year, and I just showed one for example, colder during, de or during acclimation, they acclimate, the vines acclimate a bit more. Uh, if it stays cold in the winter periods, they reach more of that, their genetic potential, like I showed in some of those previous uh, graphs. And then with the colder spring, again, we get a, we get a slower bud break, but we will, um, but ultimately the vines, it's kind of funny because even in the cold years, we seem to warm up very quickly in, in April and May, and we hit bud break roughly the same time. And areas of Europe are seeing the same thing, that yeah, there are some areas are finding, like, like I showed you uh, Alsace and Burgundy, but some areas of Italy, there's no difference in terms of bud break. And it's a lot because of the temperatures going up and down during, uh, during pre-bud break uh, conditions. However, then in the spring periods, we get this warm temperature and you can actually watch the shoots grow. I mean, we've had a couple of years, I look at some of the growers around here, they probably say, hey, <laughs> the vines looked a lot smaller when I started the day. But there, there's so much growth in the early spring with some of our growing seasons, and this can impact uh, things down the road. And that's just an example of just how trunks could be damaged when you have this earlier deacclimation. Uh, these are examples of some spring frost that we've had around here. Um, this was actually Labrusca vine that had uh, budded earlier at the grape station in 2010 in an earlier season. And this was, uh, I think, two years ago where we had a frost in the end of May. So we had, uh, there were inf inflorescence uh, on the plants and everything, and the, this was in Prince Edward County. And they basically killed not only the shoots, but also the canes and so on. And there was a lot of crop loss in that year. That's, that's pretty scary when you have frost that late. So what are some other things that are, we can expect with climate change? And one is drought. And so here in Ontario, I'm gonna talk specifically here about here in Ontario in terms of hotter and drier vintages. In some areas, drought's gonna become a big problem. And drought's only gonna get worse in areas where they already have drought, whether it's California, areas of California, Australia, so on. Here, it might, the drier conditions might actually be beneficial to us. We're, in most cases, we have too much water, too much growth. But what we've found in the last number of years where we've had a hotter and drier vintage is that, they didn't imp that this didn't impact acclimation. For the most part, it actually helped improve uh, uh, acclimation because it's tied a lot with, with uh, fruit maturity. So in those years where you have good fruit maturity, a lot of times we get good hardiness as well. However, you have to be careful with that too because if it's too early maturity, then it might not have, the vine might have just, just not well balanced and, and it can impact things further down the road. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. The one area where drought is bad is for younger plants, susceptible cultivars, so are, like hybrid varieties, for example, are more susceptible also because they have higher crop on them a lot of times, but also vineyards that are prone to drought stress, you know, don't, don't have much water available, uh, things like that. So those vines have been impacted by our drought years. In the last couple of years, we've had a lot of replants and so on, and these younger vines can suffer greatly. And we've seen some, some also some plants that had a, both combination of higher crop, you know, grower has a couple of years of a short crop, they try to make that up, and then you combine that with a drought and it can impact you in terms of, uh, in terms of hardiness. <coughs> The other thing is that we have these, grow, these warm growing seasons, and, and Tony talked a little about this last week, is that 
the, they have a carryover into the winter, such as warmer lake conditions, and then they don't, they're warmer lakes, and so they might not freeze as much during the winter, especially if it's a mild winter. Then you have these warm bodies of water, and that allows for an earlier spring, earlier bud break, and it becomes a cumulative effect in terms of, these, in terms of the lakes. So the, our lakes are our friends. We need to take care of them here in Ontario and uh, in, in the U.S. as well. The Great Lakes are critical to, to our success in terms of agriculture and our way of life. Now, this is just an example of what with our, with our varying uh, uh, seasons. There are, these, are, these are three of our hotter, drier years. You can see that they're quite similar in terms of how the vines responded. They, they acclimated at somewhat similar rates. This, this past year was a little bit more severe and there's also warmer acclimation periods. So they did not acclimate as well. And it probably was a lot to do to the weather more than during acclimation than it was to the growing season drought. And you could see that as, as part of the midwinter hardiness. The other thing is extreme precipitation. We can end up with really wet falls some years. I mean, we can have hurricanes come up the coast and with climate change, we're talking about more and more hurricanes and that type of extreme event. And when we have wet fall periods, just like how it impacts fruit maturity, the, it also impacts vines a lot. Vines do not like wet feet. They will not acclimate well. Uh, and you can see in this, in this diagram here, in this picture here, area of flooded vineyard, and the leaves are off the vines and we see a lot of green tissue. So this is going to die basically as soon as it hits negative four, negative six, something like that. If it, because it's not going to acclimate anymore at this, at this time of the year. So what, we're, what we do find is in our wetter years, if I go back, in our wetter years, like 2009, for example, we have poorer acclimation. And we, we, we find that time and time again, that these wet falls just like, like to promote more growth. Uh, late season, the vines don't shut down, and they just continue the vegetative state. Or they're just stressed from wet feet like this. And that's not good. We, we, we do some work here in, in Ontario with a lot of uh, vineyard uh, drainage and tiling, which does help this, but it is a problem. So what will climate change do? It's definitely going to bring changes in innovation agriculture, whether you like it or not. Um, a lot of times I think it's going to be forced upon us. Um, in terms of short-term solutions, things like management practices, if you have access to water, irrigation can help really reduce stress. Plant growth regulators are, are going to become more important, uh, both in, when I talked up earlier about chilling requirements in areas where dormancy, uh, with dormancy issues, plant growth regulators can help during the growing season to help mitigate some of the effects of, of the weather, and as well as post-harvest. I think uh, plant growth regulators can play a big role. The long term, the biggest solution is plant material. And in Europe, this is what they're looking at, more, more so than anything really, um, is looking at clones, rootstocks, and even new varieties in some instances. But in Bordeaux, they've been doing a lot of work uh, looking at different varieties, um, but also now doing more work with clone and rootstocks um, to try to help mitigate these, these effects of, of um, climate change and try to reduce some of the impacts of, of what's happening uh, with changes in terms of phenology and timing of phenology. Because when you're, uh, the, the best terroirs are when the, are when the vines and the fruit matures at the very end of the growing season. If, you, if vines are maturing too early and the fruit's maturing too early or too late, it doesn't get mature. But when you have that sweet spot of matching the variety and the fruit maturation to the end of the growing cycle, that's when the fruit's the best, and that's also when your hardiness is going to be probably the best as well. The other thing is new areas within regions. So whether it's moving to higher elevations or, um, or moving to areas where they can get some water, as well as completely new regions. And these are all long-term things. And, and you know, in some areas where they're growing great now, they might be growing another crop in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, it depends how quickly this, this occurs and, and what kind of risks and what, what kind of, um, yeah, what kind of risks uh, in their regions are going to take. 
So here's just an example of some of the work that we did here at the university. We published this paper with some colleagues from British Columbia, uh, BC, and elsewhere. And what we did was we sprayed uh, plant growth regulator post-harvest on uh, abscisic acid specifically. And what we found is that in a, in a warm year, uh, that we were able to slow down deacclimation and and we're able to help mitigate some of the impacts of, uh, of let's say, earlier bud break. Might not be uh, advantageous in all years, but in many years it could it could help us if this is a, a uh, if this year, for example, is uh, of a common uh, issue. And here's just an example of how certain formulations of this plant growth regulator were able to not only delay bud break, but this carried through to the throughout. Um, World, well, not to the to piece, but to piece size, I should say, not throughout the entire growing season. But you could see that we were able to show that these plant growth regulator can, this plant growth regulator can reduce some of the impacts of, of warmer climates. Again, it might not be suitable for all regions, but if your Pinot Gris is maturing too quickly and you're getting 16% potential alcohol, this might be a, a, a potential solution down the road. So this is just an example of how. Um, how a plant growth regular might be able to help uh, with the impacts of climate change. One of the other uh, long-term strategies that we're starting here at the university and partnering with the industry and with our funding organizations um, is looking at some clone and rootstock trials. And this is just an example. I just took out what clone and rootstock combinations they are. But this is all Riesling, and I just wanted to show you how we can have differences in terms of hardiness and, and deacclimation based on just selection of a different clone and a rootstock. And this is ongoing research that we're, that we're doing right now. So we're looking at some strategies to help uh, climate change or reduce the impacts of climate change here in Canada. And I think this is going to be really important uh, uh, thing that we're doing right now and, and to link this with uh, the same time with the clean plant program. So in terms of conc conclusions, there's so much you could talk about in terms of how climate change can impact uh, perennial woody plants. But overall, climate change is a major concern for agriculture and just way of life in general. It's, there's no doubt that it's going to have a, a big impact on us. And like I said, even if we change right now, we make some serious changes, we don't know what we're going to fully expect. And so we need to start looking at some of the long-term strategies as well as short-term strategies to help deal with this. And as with everything, research, outreach, and innovation are the keys to push the boundaries to, I mean, Mother Nature is, she'll have her, her, her way with you, but we need to find some ways to help deal with this and help improve the quality and sustainability of agriculture. Grapes is fine. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, but what about when we have to feed our feed families and feed countries? Uh, it's, it's a big, big issue. So we do need a lot of uh, innovation here to help help with this. This is food for thought. This was a talk I was at a couple years ago at the Insight Conference, and Thomas Homer Dixon from the Basili School of International Affairs. He said that he was talking about climate change and the economy. And he basically said the Ontario grape and wine industry contributes $10,000 to the provincial economy for every ton of grapes sold, grown and sold. In comparison, oil produced from the oil sands contributes only $70 to the Canadian economy. Just want you to think about that. When we, when we talk about the economy and everything is driven by energy, what about agriculture? And it's not like some of our agriculture is not worth anything to the economy. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of our grower and winery partners, all, this, all the faculty, staff, and students that have helped out with the data from this, uh, from this talk, as well as colleagues at KCMS and all of our people here at Brock, uh, technical services that help with our data and our equipment, as well as our website with Dwight. I'd like to thank all of our funding partners. And finally, I'd like to dedicate the talk to all the scientists and entrepreneurs trying to fight climate change, and all of those suffering from extreme weather, climate, and disease. Right now, climate change is very political, I'm not, and I'm not going to get political, but there's a lot of people trying to do a good thing, and their funding is getting cut, 
or, or they're not allowed to talk about it, all because of political motivations. So scientists are trying to help, and I just want to acknowledge all of those people, because there are people suffering from are the extreme weather, it's only going to get worse. And the poor countries, the people are only going to suffer more and more. So I just want to acknowledge that. Bernie? Do you have any uh, uh, ideas on varieties in uh, Europe that are maybe grown at higher altitudes or in Switzerland that, that would be more cold hardy, maybe known more varietal wise as opposed to hybrids that uh, do better in cold weather events? Yeah, there's. There are a number of varieties I think are of interest, and there's, like I said, there's thousands of varieties, and there's a lot of really interesting indigenous varieties to, to Europe and northern parts of Italy, uh, even some, who knows, about well, some Portuguese varieties, even, it's, even though it's a warmer climate. But I think, and they've had some success in, in the northeast uh, U.S. and Michigan and, and even New York State with Tiraldigo from Italy, uh, as well as La Grande. Um, in terms of white varieties, um, I'd still like to see what some of these Spanish varieties could even do, like Albarino or something. I don't know, Gruner, Veltliner maybe, later variety. Um, those are some varieties off the top of my head that, again, that people would know. In not, uh, some, some other varieties that might be really interesting, they don't have a... Marketing is the problem. Gamay is grown in, north, in high altitudes and stuff in Italy even Northeast Italy, it's kind of interesting. It's a very small Well, it's so for the next two years at the uh, nurseries. Game A? Yeah, Game A is pretty uh, resilient in terms of, of an infra variety. But yeah, there's, I, th I think, and this is what Europe's doing. The, the, some of the well-known regions, they're looking at alternative varieties. California's been looking at alternative varieties. They're looking more at Portugal varieties, Portuguese varieties, I should say, Italian varieties. Um, even some of the some of the local people here have tried with some Italian varieties, uh, with Corvina and, and, and whatnot. The hardness to them when we've tested them, similar to Merlot. Have you tested? And they're uh, going to be later maturing. Then I'm trying to think of its name. It's, it's a small component in Bordeaux. Um, Petit Verdot. Yes. It, Petit Verdot is quite winter hardy. Yeah. However, it's just a late maturing variety. So yeah, Petit Verdot could be. And that's another area where I think in Europe they're looking at in terms of changing the blend a little bit in terms of in terms of Bordeaux varieties. But yeah, there's definitely opportunities. There's so many uh, options out there for varieties that I don't think we've looked into very many of them that could be suitable for for here. Eastern there's Eastern European varieties too, from Croatia, uh, Slovenia, and so on. Like those could indigenous varieties that could be of interest. Yeah, there's one more question, but the. Uh... Have you looked at, at doing maybe, uh, now that you got maybe 20 years of, of data for climate and maybe 10 years of data for the uh, cold tolerance, to look at each individual variety to say, here's your sort of risk to benefit on growing this variety and, and how it plays forward if we have continuing events of extreme cold in the winter or late spring frost and early bud break. I think, yeah, that's part of the goal we want to do, even with the clone rootstock researches that we're currently doing, and is to match the varieties to, to, to the climate and see what are, how they're performing. We have some information, but it is longer term to see how the varieties perform uh, during the winter, but we're, we're trying. Okay. But it's not, you can't make that, that judgment after a couple of seasons. I just returned from California uh, about two or three weeks ago. We could go to Nava because it was flooded. So we went to Brentwood, California, which is central. Uh, and uh, it's amazing the amount of grapes that they're growing in those areas. I visited about five different wines, and we also dealt with the same thing. They, Get all the Portuguese varieties and marvelous. And yet, in the morning, there was ice on the window of the cars in Central California, or North and Central. Mm -hmm. So they, they, have, they have a lot of good things to say about the Portuguese varieties. They withstand the cold, 
and the one taking down the drought as well. Yeah, there, I mean, you have to deal with drought first of all, and then periodic frost. There, there's more wind machines going in in California. And the wind machines that I see. In some, in certain regions, there's there's yeah, actually more wind machines going. Yeah, yeah. For the area, you go for miles and miles. That's so all. It's great to on the side of the road. It goes up to the mountain. They have cattle of goats. Uh, amazing the, the quantity of uh, wine and vineyards in that area. I used to go to California quite often. Five years ago, there was nothing there. Six years ago, there was nothing. And they all say the same thing. So I was wondering if some of those Portuguese vines, the varieties, could be brought to Ontario. Yeah, they could be worth trialing them. I mean, there's two things. One is they have to mature. Secondly, they have to survive the winter. And a lot of times, we just look at, if, oh, that's too late of a season for maturation, but they could still be really winter hardy. And I think that's kind of where Petit Verdot fits in. And it's not until you, you plant them and you do some testing. I mean, you don't want to take that loss as a grower and plant you know, many, many acres of these varieties. Our problem is just our lack of access to plant material in Canada. In, in getting access to these some of these varieties. I was amazed by the Italian who were getting great at those grapes. I don't believe it unless I go back in October this year and look at it and make sure with my other guys they're sitting there getting anywhere between twelve and twenty tons of perfect grape. Oh, yeah, they're, they're productive. The same with the town guys, they're very productive. That, that's a problem that we can run into here in Ontario though is just very productive vines can lead to issues with with acclimation just because there's just so much crop on them. And if they're late season and highly productive, that's where we can run issues. That's my question. Yeah. Do we have like, things like Tanan or Tiberdo or even Cab Soap here in Ontario, if they don't fully ripen, does that have to affect their tolerance quite a bit? So, or if you were to say get a frost before you pick, would you consider looking at that where you test the cold hardiness based on one of the fruits that like in capsule? If it's all a frost, how that affects the cold hardiness? Yeah, we've done some work with looking at timing, like looking at crop level as well as timing of harvest. And I actually had a couple slides in there, but I took them out. But oh, um, well, I'd like to see that. Later. Yeah. What, what we find is that the, with the higher crop level, it'll, it'll delay acclimation, but generally speaking, the vines will reach the same level of maximum hardiness. However, if the vines are overcropped, uh, that you can have a, a larger difference in terms of even maximum hardiness. Um, but it was amazing that even very small differences in yields can, can change the rates of acclimation. Yeah, I'm just curious. Time what of harvest didn't on. have a difference. Didn't make a difference, really. No, it was more crop level had a greater influence. And there's been a number of studies that have been done uh, across North America now, looking at removing fruit and and all similar found the same similar thing. Yeah. Uh, I have more following up with what, the, what she said. The cap solve in a frost, let's say a negative one, doesn't lose its leaves, whereas like the pinot will drop all of its leaves. So some neighbors that are growing Petit Pinot Bordeaux are saying it can hold its leaves well into the end of November. But it still has fruit, right? Yeah. Pinot doesn't have fruit anymore. Yeah, that's the difference. It's at a different stage. And that's one thing, just from, ob from observation, if you watch, Look at the vines that have been harvested, they lose their leaves shortly after being harvested. Absolutely. Whereas if the fruit has vine or if the vine has fruit on it, it'll hold on to its leaves better. But the leaves will start senescing shortly after harvest, after you harvest them. That's just an observation right there, just that you can make as a grower. One more question. Paul, you had a question? Uh, I just curious about, uh, you said in the spring when things deacclimate, they generally tend to hit blood break at the same time, no, no matter what the year looks like. I'm just curious if that, if there's any known relationship with the light, if that's like a major contribution to when the blood break happens. That's something that we're, we're looking more and more into. The, the biggest thing is, is temperature though, because we, in a week, if we have 25 degree weather and the low is 15, the but the vines are they they want to start to grow. They're like, wait a second, I'm behind here. They don't think that way, but 
it, and it is temperature and temperature induced, but yeah, light will play a role too. The sun gets stronger, the tissue's heating up more, and the temperature of the plant itself is, we'd look at ambient temperature, but it's also important to look at the temperature of the, of the plants too. And we think that's partly a difference in, in various cool climate regions, whether it's here or it's uh, BC, Washington State, and those areas, there, we have different uh, types of solar radiation, different levels of sol solar radiation. So what's the impact of that on, on some of these factors? And so these are all things, questions that we've thought about and we're just, all of us in the cool hardiness world are trying to learn more and more about these things. You can have a million little experiments and that's what we're, we're starting to do actually. We have been doing, but yeah. There's so much to learn. And like I said, there's so much that we need to learn still about the plants and how they're responding. And then you throw in, well, we don't know how the, how our climate's going to be from one day to the next even. So it's a real challenge. So we try to just smooth out those extremes in terms of what the plants are experiencing, I guess. Please join me in thanking Jim for a great talk. <laughs> A small token of our appreciation. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had to cancel uh, Dr. Don Sears' uh, lecture because we had a power outage here at Brock. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to offer that lecture Wednesday next week. And it's on the copula function modeling and its application to Bordeaux ratings. Uh, so stay tuned, check the Covey website, and we'll let you know if that's on. Uh, but our next regularly scheduled uh, lecture is April 5th. It'll be Dr. Gary Pickering uh, sharing his research on um, avoiding and remediating uh, greenness in wine uh, due to methoxypyrazines. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you again.